What is OGL and how is it going to affect Dungeons and Dragons moving forward? And how does copyright keep your character good for 56 years, but Mickey Mouse is going on 100? Well, let us tell you. Welcome to the Nerd News Podcast, starring Tyson Cox and Tyler Waltz. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I am your host, as always, Tyson Cox. Joined with me is Tyler Waltz. And today we're going to be talking about OGL and Dungeons and Dragons. Tyler, do you know what OGL is? I don't. Uh, well, not until you very briefly gave me a rundown before the show. Just complained about it? Yeah. So it's OGL is a very interesting thing. It, it stands for Open Gaming License. Open Gaming License, which sounds nice. It is. It basically outlines what you're allowed to do with a uh, system so you can't okay. copyright rolling a d rolling a d20 not copyrightable right making it so your system has very strict rules on what happens a little bit more blurry a little more wiggle room okay like you can copy attributes like oh it's the the system is like oh i have a 20 in my stats plus five can't copyright that really but you can copyright if you the way you phrase it is that becomes copywritten. Okay. And OGL is the Open Gaming License, and it started about three, uh, third edition. And what they did is just like, hey, go nuts, have a good time, uh, get more content out there because it is trying to grow the player base for sure. Now with the popularity of fifth edition and uh, upcoming D and D one and their complaint about being under monetized. Okay. They're changing it and they're changing it in a way that, which is normally not ever for the good. It's not, it's not, it's going to affect very specific pockets of stuff. Okay. Uh, their, their quoting is like, there's uh less than 20 creators making over $750,000 a year. Which is, that's great. Good for you yeah, guys. Good for you guys. I think that's like Beatles and Grimm and, um, oh, a couple other ones that are Cobalt Press. Like okay. the people that are making very good secondary stuff yeah. that is supplementary. Which makes sense. If you, it's weird because it's somebody else's product, but if you are enhancing that product, you, I think you have every right to yeah. sell you that material. And they get around a lot of it by saying things instead of saying like compatible with Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition, mm -hmm. they just say five E compatible. Yeah, because they don't have five E copyrighted, but they have Dungeons and Dragons copyrighted. Oh, okay. You can copyright Dungeons and Dragons, but you can't copyright five E, or they haven't yet. So you're allowed to use five E okay. for your marketing of your product. Mm -hmm. So you make a module, you make your, you know, you you make an adventure, and you say like five E compatible, perfectly fine, uh, but you can get away with doing that and avoid infringing on the OGL if you just write your own rules for it. Okay. But if you directly reference fifth edition rules, it becomes copywritten. So you have to be very careful to sneak your way around it. Yes and no. Because you can use a thing called an SRD, which is System Reference Document, mm -hmm. which is allows you to use their stuff under the OGL, because OGL only cares about people that make over, I think it was $50,000 a year. Okay. Then you start have to telling people, like you have to submit your books. Okay. Like it gets very sticky. This is starting to sound like laws and taxes where they've just made it so complicated. You just got to get somebody else to do it for you. <laughs> yes. Yes. This is the, like, if this was about, I don't know, something unimportant to me, like my taxes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'd be bored and sleepy. Yeah. But because it's about wizards and dragons, right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I got to learn everything. Yeah. This affects me none, but I better learn everything about it. That's so kooky. All right. So yeah, let me let me try to do a more concise breakdown on that. Uh, if you make over $50,000 a year, mm -hmm. you have to then submit your books for review. Okay. All of them. Your whole books. Oh, everything. To them. So they can go Even over the it to secret me. ones that you don't publish. Those are just for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you have to submit your books uh, and then you have to start paying on it and you have to like you lose, I think, a little bit of control as well. Okay. But like you can go ahead, not include the system reference document, not include specific rules ripped from it and avoid copywritten IPs like beholders, mind flares, stuff like that. Okay. And that's completely fine. Okay. Hmm. But 
here's where it gets worse. In the 1.1 OGL update, uh, static print, which includes paper, PDFs, uh-huh. anything like that, that is that is copywritten. So okay. specific character sheets, anything that calculates online, like so you know how I have like roll twenty has a online dice roller? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Copywritten now. Really? Yeah, because it's like the system is... Oh, because it calculates it with the system. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes it more complicated for sure. Yeah, um, but um, like how D&D Beyond has like you fill your character sheet out and it tabulates everything for you. Yeah. Copywritten. So now it's mm. getting much stickier for secondhand games to do convenient, convenient use of... Yeah, I'm curious what percentage of a lot of those side things use that. Because I'm still very much in person playing the game to where I'm physically rolling dice anyway. Same, same. But I think we actually might be in a like at least 50-50 or soft minority. It's going to be interesting because a lot of people have shifted. A lot of people have probably never played D&D in person. That's true, especially since 2020. Yeah. I mean, basically once everybody was kind of forced to do online stuff... Mm -hmm. we're kind of doing online stuff now. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. It took a lot of effort for me to leave my house to come and do the podcast. I don't know. I was always chomping at the bit. I was always (laughs) just like, I want to roll dice. (laughs) I I think it's so much better in person, but it's that convenience factor. That's true. That's huge for some people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Also, nerds, it's a weird kind of community because we have our Gen Cons and we have our game shops Mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but there's a lot of really rural nerds that they their option is internet yeah they meet people online and they play online i didn't get a play regularly for 10 years because because i didn't have a group Mm -hmm. i moved around too much and then i eventually had to make my own group yeah but like it i would have played all the time if i had oh yeah all the resources now yeah absolutely but yeah it looks like it's going to be one of those things that doesn't affect the minor the majority of people Uh in an obvious way but it's going to have a lot of really subtle back end stuff. Yeah. Uh, especially they're, they're saying that D and D one, which is sixth edition is mm-hmm. going to be backwards compatible with five E. Okay. Which is weird. I don't know if they mean that like it'll be easy to translate over. Yeah. I'm trying to think what backwards compatible with five E would mean. It's, gonna, it, it's the systems, the stories, the like, yeah. Cause like is backwards compatible mean that this story like strawed, is mm-hmm. canon still or like what does that i'm gonna go with yes because you know uh, castle ravenloft strahd mm-hmm. uh playing my first two, uh today actually yeah. uh those are all like classic yeah those sure. are copywritten mm-hmm. sword coast copywritten yeah you know specific stuff copywritten yeah other things can't copyright can't copyright elves because elves are out there you know yeah. but like you can copyright beholders and yeah, elves are out there. They're loose. I don't know if we can. <laughs> we can't get them back. <laughs> Hard to wrestle. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think just to kind of wrap this up, it feels like it's going to affect monetarily a very small percentage of people, but mm-hmm. in a way that I feel won't be great for the overall. Yeah. Like a lot of uh, people are going to be dis- discouraged from creating new things that push the boundaries that might get integrated in later. Yeah. I guess the silver lining or like a bit of hope in this situation is that I didn't know any of this stuff existed. Yeah. But the fact that you can create supplementary content, Mm -hmm. make money is really cool. Yeah. Like there could be a ton of people out there right now that have no idea. They've been making campaigns and just having fun with their friends for years. Mm -hmm. They might be able to earn a little bit of money off their favorite homebrew. Yeah. Or even if you just love your story so much, you can just put it out for free. You, You can't get sued for nothing. Right. You know, so put it up on drive through rpg.com for free or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, if you're making under X amount of money, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I don't know if many people are going to be cranking out $50,000 stories. It's yeah. It's 20. I think they said 20 people are making $750,000, yeah. which, which I kept reading. I saw one number that made it seem like that was the benchmark mm-hmm. just through the quote. And I saw a number that said 50 K. Yeah. 50 K makes more sense. Makes more sense. It's also a much more doable number. Yeah. So like if you like you can that's a job yeah you know what I mean yeah that's a job for sure, um but yeah so th- that's pretty much it that's what you wanted to go over for the yeah so oh, and let us know if I missed anything or what I misspoke because it was a lot of convoluted law talk yeah. um but yeah open gaming license it is there it feels like it's to protect the company which mm-hmm. is I get it good and bad good and bad but also uh what they're updating feels 
not great. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's one of those things where if you have X amount of freedoms and then freedoms get taken away, mm -hmm. it's always noticeable, right? Yeah. Like if you, I think we made this joke actually when we were talking about like the Sims games, like people loved the Sims one, loved the Sims two. Oh yeah. Loved the Sims three. Mm -hmm. And then they came out with all those expansions for the Sims three mm -hmm. and the Sims four came out and then they came out with an expansion pass, which was a culmination of the expansion pass of the third one. And they were like, wait a minute. You are taking things away that were either in the base game or was already something we paid for. Yeah. It's so much more noticeable when something is now missing. And it's jarring. And I knew that, I think I knew something like this was coming up when they were quoted about saying that D&D &D is under, uh, under monetized. Yeah, because it exploded in popularity. Yeah. And they were going for more of a niche audience that was buying everything. Mm -hmm. But now it has so much broad appeal, they can squeeze more water out of it. Actually, I want to take a minute and talk about like the monetization of D&D &D because it is not like it's not making money. Right. The, their thing is, I think they're just underutilizing what they're already doing. Yeah. Like they do sell their own minis, but it's they ju just started doing that not too long ago. It used to be like Reaper and uh, all these other all third party places would release minis that you yeah. just go, oh yeah, that works for that. Yeah. But with like the advent of that uh, merchandising, like I bought a Blink, uh, little a baby Blink uh, displacer based. Uh, oh, bought okay. a little baby displacer beast for my Witchlight campaign. Yeah. Like they have all these stuff. Like Beatles and Grimm should be what Wizards is doing, mm -hmm. where they sell their base book, or if you got the money, buy this four hundred fifty dollar book set. Yeah, and have these amazing handout maps and cut like die cut stuff and like all these yeah. really. That's where I think they are dropping the ball, and it seems like they are re knee jerk reacting to like, oh, these offshoots are making money. Instead of using their power and sway and just outperforming them, they're yeah. just trying to corral them. Yeah, yeah, because it's much easier to get rid of competition than compete with competition sometimes. Like, there, there's like two mentalities that they could have went into it, right? They could have looked and been like, oh, all these guys are making X amount of money mm -hmm. supplementing our product. Yeah. We have every bit of power to supplement our product if we beat them in quality, we have more resources probably than these people yeah. do. They could have just competed and people would have been fine. Yeah. Right? Like people would have been like, oh, that sucks. There's competition now, but it would also force them to get better a mm -hmm. bit as well. But instead they looked at it and they were like, that money should be ours. Yep. Like it's two very different mentalities going into it. Yeah. One of them one of them feels like it would like elevate the platform. The other feels like it will not. Yeah, it's 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 strangling it so that you can only be the only one with a supply chain through it. Yeah. Which is again, why a lot of people have drifted, like they got into five E and then they found out other games exist. Yeah. Like Pathfinder. Pathfinder is a huge example. Mm -hmm. Their second edition system. I've been looking into their, their rules. Yeah. Seems great. It does seem great. We like, did, we did those samples at Gen Con. So much fun. No. Second edition's even better. Oh, we didn't play second edition. We played first edition. Oh, okay. Well, there yeah. we go. Like it, it's and like that's a company that seems to be always I increasing and striving and listening to their community. Yeah. Uh, versus where Wizard seems to be going, like, well, we, you got our money. Yeah. Right. So, but, yep. Which seems to be a trend with Wizard recently. Yeah, they like to they like to get their money and not work for it. It seems. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, anything else you want to say, man? No, I think that's about it. Maybe we cut that last line out. Seem mean, but yeah, uh, I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the big multi-million dollar corporation that we said it's fair that they have competition. Fuck us. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think that wraps up part one. Uh, thank you guys for listening to part one. Uh, in part two, we're going to talk about some copyright laws because uh, Disney is freaking out a little bit about 2024. Yeah, oh, man. So check us out. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. And uh, we're going to get right into it. Copyright and uh, public domain. So public domain is a weird thing. Yeah, this is going to be an exhilarating topic, ironically. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting and kind of funny because I saw an article that said, what is Disney's plan for 2024? Mm -hmm. And that is when Mickey Mouse becomes public domain. So all those cartoons I've been drawing, I can... Uh... Yeah, you can. <laughs> Stop taking debit cards for <laughs> yeah. instead of cash only. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can, it can leak into the plastic space. <laughs> yeah. So the, public the cash or Bitcoin, baby. Yeah. So the original public domain law was that your character 
is yours mm-hmm. and nobody else can use it in any way for 56 years. Do you think they picked 56 because they were like, all right, you'll probably invent it around 20 to 30 it and then literally 56 years you'll be dead. Average lifespan. Yeah. Was it really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm so smart. Yeah, because the very next thing that changed was in 70, 76. Mm-hmm. In 76, they changed the law to be 50 years post creator's death. Oh, okay. So that extended it quite a bit yeah. because the copyright kind of started when you were alive when the character was created. Yeah. But there was a sub clause in it, which is where Disney's foot kind of got in there where it was 75 years. If it was created for an employer. So everything created under the Disney name was created by a guy for Disney Mm -hmm. making the copyright 75 years instead of 50 for individual artists. Okay. Yeah. So that's where some of the shenanigans and now we're ending the 75? No, we're not. Because in 1998, it was expanded for corporations to have <laughs> 95 years after the death of the creator for the company. Okay. For a character that's been published. <laughs> or 120 years from the copyright of the character if there isn't a publication that currently has the character. Basically giving you a... 15-ish year, that's bad math, Uh, (laughs) 25-year grace period to create a character and publish it. Okay. Yeah. So I, I kinda I kinda get it. It really did feel like like there's a log and a frog on a bog and the Basically. Bog. It's it's basically just law. Because yeah. the basic law of fifty six years is still there. Yeah. And then they added the sub clause or whatever of mm-hmm. after the death of the creator. Yeah. Unless it was created by an employer for a an entity. Yeah. But then also if it's a corporate, it like it just keeps adding like sub point A, point B, point C. Yeah. And Disney's always had their fingers in this to a certain degree. And the another way to get around it is redesigning a character. Yes. Because this deep dive had me interested because I love big monsters. You know, I love Godzilla, I love King Kong, all of mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Well, King Kong was 1933. So technically public domain. For the creator, when I looked into it, he falls under public domain. Yeah. But Warner Brothers owns the copyright and the rights to King Kong. So he fell into a weird zone. So I started seeing like the ins and outs of how places are getting around this. And Disney isn't as much freaking out because every redesign of their character is a new copyright. Oh, okay. So what's coming available in 2024 is the old Steamboat Willie Mickey Mouse. Oh, okay. Not any modern version. Every time they redesign them, that is a new Mickey Mouse copyright. So, just so I'm clear, cannot use red pants, white gloves Mickey. Correct. But in 2024, you can use Steamboat Willie Mickey? So far. Oh, We don't know if they're going to change okay, anything. Right. They, they got two years to figure <laughs> something out. They are, they are burning the oil. But yes, that is exactly correct. So do you think they already have it figured out and they're just waiting to do it? That's I don't why, know. That's why no one, they're not like, oh, no. And Every time that they've had big pushes before, it's been like 15-ish years before the law takes place. Yeah. Because laws move slow. Yeah. So I don't know. I also don't know if that version of Mickey, what's it worth to them now? You know? Like, yeah. How much money does that character bring in? Or how much money would that character bring in an independent artist trying to use it? True. Right? Because if you look at the version of King Kong that is technically public domain in 1933. He looked gross. Yeah, that's not going to... It's going to be difficult to sell that as a product now that it is in public domain. Yeah. But what you could do things like multiverse <laughs> that... Uh, like multiverse, that fighting game. Yeah, yeah. I would love to beat the... Beat the be- beat the brakes <laughs> yeah. off, old Mickey. <laughs> right, just yeah. have King Kong banana splat him. Well, the the whole reason that I kind of was looking into this is because I haven't seen it yet, but I'm excited for that new Winnie the Pooh horror movie. Oh yeah, yeah, because Winnie Winnie's up. Yeah, yeah. So Winnie the Pooh, public domain as of I believe last year, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, why did they make him look like that? Yeah. Like because the whole character isn't just up for grabs. Like the Correct. Disney version of Winnie the Pooh 
Mm-hmm. That character is copywritten. That but one, the name, but the name Winnie the Pooh, open the original book where it is a yellow bear with a red shirt. Mm-hmm. That is now good to go. Yes. Any characters that were created for the Disney, like Piglet, no, not Piglet. Piglet was he was, a, he was an OG, like Eeyore, Tigger. They won't. I can't remember what original. They were all. They were all there. Matter. I know Tigger specifically was created by Disney. Oh, okay. So well, he is not public domain. Oh, okay. And none of those designs can be used in anything. Okay. Same thing goes for like Robin Hood and like, like for example, in uh, God of War, they used like Thor and yeah. like old, old stuff. But not Marvel's Thor. Correct. It's the designs that are copyrighted now. So in 95 years post the death of the writer that thought of Chris Hemmingsworth's Thor, mm-hmm. people can make fan art. And sell Thor. I want to. <laughs> I want to spoil something. <laughs> I think people are already making fan art, yeah, right, <laughs> and selling it, right. Um, so that sent me down this like weird spiral because I think public domain is a very good thing. I don't think it should be that far out. I uh, well, so it's a very interesting thing. How far out would you put it then? I I genuinely think the f- original fifty six years was a pretty good spot. That's fair. That's good. Yeah. Uh, I think long, I, it would suck to be a guy that lived to 90 and just watch your product be taken and then just made into like push pops and pornos. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because that's the dichotomy. Yeah. It's like it's you're, you're, at the same time, you're like, why did I not think of either of these? <laughs> yeah. So, so the way that I see it, 56 years, if you think about that, that gives you as a creator plenty of time to do things with it. Yeah. You're, is it going to stay that same design because once i figured out that about the whole redesign things Mm -hmm. they redesign mickey mouse every four years do they really i i I, you see commercials and like with the tv shows and everything that's out there and the disney plus and they've got spinoffs and this there's so many different mickeys yeah for everything the redesign would keep you current Mm -hmm. right and eventually like for example godzilla i love godzilla He's still relevant in 2022 from 1954. Yeah. If he did hit public domain like he was supposed to, then there would be way more content that could be made like by fans. It would give the characters more life sooner for relevancy. True. I I think you can do more with it if you give the public a chance, but you've given plenty of time for the original creator to do something with it. Yeah. Okay. So this feels kind of similar to the D and D yeah. D and D stuff where yeah. it, it will make competition happen. Yeah. But we're also thinking about it in a way of like healthy competition. We're not like for sure. So say Spider-Man uh, for, you know, doing great right now with Marvel, but then Sony gets to have their hand in again and just make uh-huh. do do the Spider-Man's. Okay. Like I, it's, mm. It's, it's weird because it seems it seems good when like fans get a hold of it feels good, but like mm-hmm. when corporations get a hold of it because they can also just make money feels bad. Yeah, I don't see why that's necessarily an issue though, because if something's public domain, anytime a corporation makes something, they're going to copyright copyright their version of it. That's okay. the whole thing. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. And then you can flip it too if it's exactly. available. Fans that. X amount of big corporation or that are mm-hmm. fans can make it and, and make a, copy a good it. Venom and movie then and then they don't have, have to yeah. be mad about it. Right. Yeah. Cause like I love Godzilla. Right. So for me, if Godzilla was public domain, I would create a version of Godzilla mm-hmm. that I think is dope as hell. I can copyright that version. Weird. He has nipples, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the drawings <laughs> and he talks and just says, I love you. I don't know. <laughs> I love you, son. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it would, it would give a, a certain creative perspective and give characters new life to where, yeah, you can copyright a version of something, but now whoever wants to create a cool ass Godzilla and the bad ones, and it'll it'll make it all even grounds now. Okay. So yeah, Sony will always have their Spider Man, Marvel will always have their Thor, Winnie the Pooh, whatever. They'll always have new designs and stuff. Yeah, but it would at least give more competition a chance yeah. to where not everything is Disney, not everything is Marvel. You know, all right, you got me sold. Boom. 
capitalism. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, no. <laughs> like, show's over. Uh, uh, oh, 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 beans. <laughs> but I think, I think that's what. You got anything else you want to bring up about that? Let's no, go. I just thought that was really interesting because everybody always wonders why every few years there's an article about Mickey Mouse coming to, you know, an end for yeah. God. And it's not even really that. Because the most popular version of Mickey Mouse wasn't even created until the late 40s, early 50s. Oh, wow. So we've still got until 2040 something, I believe, for the classic red shorts, you know, Mickey Mouse. I I guess I should say, oh, boy. Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And sued. Uh, (laughs) Because those were silent films. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. No, that falls under fair use, I think. But uh, Uh, Which is a whole other can of worms. But uh, yeah, well, maybe we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, hey guys, check out uh, Nerd News. We're doing a live show if you're in Indianapolis, uh, January 18th. We're doing a live D and D game at the White Rabbit Cabaret, and we are so excited, the most excited. Yeah, we're a little over half sold out already. Yeah, we are. We're gonna sell out. So which get is your exciting. tickets fast. Uh, and then also, I believe you're you're you're, you're spearheading a, a comic book. Yeah, yeah. February 3rd, we're doing a, a comic book uh, shop show. It's for a Magic the Gathering release party, though. Uh, so check that out. Uh, we'll have more details online as it gets a bit closer because uh, it's still over a month out. Yep. But yeah, stay tuned. We'll get you more details on that. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for checking out Nerd News. We don't have advertising, so you are the advertising. Now, if you liked it, go ahead and tell a friend, like, comment, share, subscribe, or even leave a review on Apple. Uh, Every little bit helps. It's insane. You guys have no idea how much your support means to us. Uh, And if you want to do a little bit more, we have launched our Patreon. So if you would uh, support us financially, go check out our Patreon. All our content is free, uh, but we do have rewards at every tier. So I just want to say thank you all again, and we'll see you next time.